Hey guys, Kribben Governor from the Gut Health Gurus podcast. I've got a background in food science and today I have an amazing guest. His name is Roland Pankovic. Did I get that right, Roland? You, you nailed it. Awesome. First time. Wonderful. And a good he, Irish name, right? <laughs> <laughs> And he and he's he's known as a, a protege of a guy with an equally difficult name to pronounce, Ted Ted Achikuso. <laughs> I think I just butchered yeah, that. He will give it to you. You got you went two for two. <laughs> we have Indian judges. I'm not too sure when I got that right, but Roland's being very, very kind to me. So I do appreciate appreciate the sentiment, Roland. And Roland, what I want to say is a huge thank you for coming onto the podcast. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for uh, thank you for exposing me to more of the Commonwealth. I mean, you're in Australia, right? Yeah, Melbourne, I'm Australia. Canada, A. Eh? So we beg, we got that connection. So it's good to make friends, right? Exactly, connecting from halfway across the world. I love that, and and I really, I really wanted wanted to get someone onto the podcast with that kind of scientific nous behind mitochondria because we've had some mitochondria people amazing mitochondria people but what i wanted to do is really break down the connection between mitochondria the gut gut microbiota gut microbiome so i thought roland who's an amazing speaker such an engaging knowledgeable fellow and i thought i have to get him onto the podcast to have a chat and, and make it crystal clear that mitochondria and gut are implicitly connected and fundamental for our wellness. So firstly, Roland, and I always ask this question, who is Roland Pankovic? Oh my goodness. Well, it was a dark day in August of 1986 when, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. You know, it, it it's hard to pigeonhole myself into who I am. Um, I'm someone who loves what it is I do for a living. And I'm someone who I hope one day can play a role in changing the perspectives of how we see health. I don't necessarily want the notoriety or the glory for that. I actually am I'm quite <laughs> crowd averse, but it's more like I see what people are becoming uh, pulled towards in health and wellness. And it's becoming more knowledgeable. It's becoming more accountable for their actions and along the way, I think there need to be specific nodes in the network who can help shine lights and shed perspectives. You know, you mentioned my mentor. Uh, I remember a conversation I had with Dr. Ted, who is a brilliant man who's done everything and anything. And he said, you know, Roland, the most valuable thing someone can share with you in the world is perspective. So, you know, who, I, who am I? I? I would like to be someone who shares perspective with people. And even if I never meet a multitude of these people that this ends up helping, uh, I know that I would be happy just the knowledge that could potentially be. So that maybe is, it's part of the question. And the other aspect is, um, you know, I'm someone who's always been interested in health and wellness. Uh, I used to be a, a high level athlete doing uh, professional and amateur martial arts, um, had a background in exercise mechanics for many years. So I used to fix broken people from a physical perspective and then was encouraged to go to school for nutrition because those who were in exercise kept asking me advice on nutrition because I knew it was my interest. Went to school at a nutrition school called the Institute of Holistic Nutrition in Toronto. After I got out of there, I knew I wanted a little bit more as far as the clinical side and the, the intersection between alternative health and clinical was at the time functional medicine. So I started studying some functional medicine and as I got through that, I started podcasting myself and I started interviewing these greats. No different than, than what you're doing, although it just sounded like I called myself a great. <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, a great man. You were really awesome at what they did and they shared amazing perspectives. So it helped me learn more. And then I got connected with the founder of Health Optimization Medicine. And in the interview, he actually said to me, you know, you're going to bring it to Canada. And at the time I went, huh? Come again? Because <laughs> <laughs> for me, it was this, holy shit moment. And then lo and behold, January 2017, the first gathering of health optimization happened. Uh, and now it's become a world movement to where I have a, a clinic I operate in Toronto, uh, just outside rather. I have clients all over the continental United States. I have clients in Manila. Uh, I'm taking off to Zurich for a conference in evolutionary medicine next week. So it's become this world 
global scale thing that has me always just laughing and so grateful for this, you know, this Canadian guy who liked health and look where it is now. You know, I have someone from Australia who wants to know what it is I have to say. So I'm, I'm just enthralled by that whole process. Absolutely. And I mean, it's such an honor. And I, oh, that, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is how you actually met, met Ted because I look at Ted and I think, man, when I, when I get to that age, I, I have no idea how old Ted is. I'm Ted thinking, is ageless. Ageless, timeless, and formless. <laughs> exactly. I think, well, if I, if I, when I get to that age, I hope I look half as good as Ted. Because, I mean, I mean, the way you look is not the only metric, but the guys, I mean, the aura that he puts out when you watch him on screen is like, just wellness and he just looks so healthy. If I could describe what healthy should look like without doing blood works or anything like that, I would say, I want to look like this guy when I hit that age. Yeah. I mean, and that's the key, right? It's, you know, I always say we are the sum of our inputs, meaning that if you imagine the human body as an organic robot and it has all these inputs, most of them external, some of them internal, uh, the sum of our inputs should be harmonious. And, and though that harmony should be to the tune of health. Mm. And then the output is the manifestation of health as you see it, as you live it. When you look at someone be like, a uh, person knows something or I, I want to know what it is they do. And that, that's kind of, uh, that's the infection, the health and wellness addiction that I want to put out to everyone. So that's my whole, uh, that's the ethos. That's the whole purpose. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your <laughs> origin story for one of a better word, Roland. So let, let's, let's, dig into it. So, so today we're going to be, sorry, say that again. I got my shovel. Let's dig into it. Uh, Let's dig into it. Absolutely. So what, what I thought we'd, we'd lay the foundation for the conversation by defining some of the the broader topics that we're going to be talking about today. So how about we start with, let's start with the mitochondria because I know Ted's huge on mitochondria and his work of mitochondria and yourself. It's a big area of focus. So let's, Define to the people, and we've had other guys talking about mitochondria, but let's, let's from your perspective, what, what is a mitochondria? Well, you know, it's funny. I actually was doing some research, and there's one thing that everyone knows as a buzzword when they hear mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. I can tell you that term was invented in 1957 because right. I read that. <laughs> <laughs> so that is still the main thing that one associates mitochondrial function with. It's the organelle. So it's, it's, a, it's a structure inside of the human cell that takes the proteins, the carbs, the fats, but hopefully mostly the carbs and the fats that we eat, and it converts them into what I call the cell, cellular energy currency, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, through mm-hmm. a series of enzymatic steps, both with and without oxygen. So basically, if one is eating a sweet potato or they're having some coconut, or whatever it is they're eating, after the digestion process has been facilitated, those compounds are being transported to the cells because energy is primordial to function and optimal function at that. You know, uh, without optimal energy, a cell doesn't have the ability to do what it is as a cell. It can't divide, it can't output various compounds, it can't operate in its specialized nature. So the mitochondria is the thing that primarily helps power up the cell. It also has some other important functions, um, like it is the thing that senses any kind of external threat to the cell. You know, there's something by... um, a very awesome researcher, Robert Navio, he coined something called the cell danger response. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when a a virus, a pathogen, something is trying to get access to the resources of our cells, it's the mitochondria that change the sensing switch inside the cell in order to help make it inhospitable for that thing to survive. Uh, Mitochondria also regulates cell lifespan via autophagy and apoptosis. And they also regulate calcium metabolism inside the cell. So they have a multitude of different roles I should probably mention they also are a major factor in epigenetic control too. Mm. So the, the health of a cell is down to the health of the mitochondria. And then the health of all future mitochondria is directly correlated to what you do to them or subject them to based upon your lifestyle, your diet, your activity factor, even your thoughts and your emotions. All of those things are influencing mitochondrial function. So they really are one of the guys that's in charge in terms of making sure that cell can function optimally. Wow, that's that's incredible. That that's such a, a succinct description of the the function of, of mitochondria. And and one thing we we could 
explore and a question for you. What's, what's your thoughts on mitochondria and the production of matrix water? Matrix water. Is that um, like the, uh, the, specific, the special kind of water, like the deuterium depleted stuff that houses yes. the mitochondria? Absolutely. You know, here's the thing. There are a lot of, I don't want to put them as um, gimmicky things, but there are things that are promoted in the industry. I'm not an expert in the deuterium depleted water or anything of that nature in regards to consumption of it. I know that, you know, through mitochondrial function, there's this process that's called uncoupling, which increases the thermal heat production of your mitochondria. And water in our cells, if you've read The Fourth Phase of Water by Dr. Gerald Pollack, you know, it acts like a battery because it becomes charge separated. So the exclusion zone water happens uh, close to that infrared heat that the mitochondria spit out. I don't know what happens when you consume, swallow, and digest the water via oral consumption. I think that if one has optimal mitochondrial function, there might be optimal amounts of matrix water inside their cells, providing that their cells are healthy and functioning optimally. Yes. Uh, I don't think it's going to hurt you to drink that kind of water, but at the same time, uh, I don't know how we measure a difference. You know what I mean? Because the health optimization perspective is testing and measuring everything. So your mm -hmm. objective as you can be in a health practice versus the subjective thing to say, to say someone subjectively feels better from something. I'll never discredit that, but I don't know what mechanisms are at play. So in terms yes. of that, I, I don't, I haven't really dug into it too much if I'm being honest. Yes. The, like, where, where I was going with that was, wasn't consuming a deuterium depleted water. It was about the cell itself having a proton gradient. I think and you've, you've spoken about this before as well. Mm -hmm. The cell's ability or the mitochondrial ability to discriminate between deuterium and normal hydrogen. Yes. Yep. So to, to your point, producing your own deuterium depleted water for want of yes. a better word. So a hundred percent. It's one of the, the, the perspectives in evolutionary biology is that, you know, we've been doing these things long before someone realized the methodology of finding another way. So if one wants to optimize that process, do what you can back to the explanation of the inputs to optimize the input. So your mitochondrial function can uncouple and not uncouple, or it can optimize a gradient versus spitting out too many free radicals or, create deuterium rather than concentrate hydrogen. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you nailed an excellent point there as well. The mitochondria producing heat. They do. Because, yeah. So that, that's, that, that's going to be pretty important. If, if you jump in a time machine and go back 20,000 years and thinking of this poor old caveman sitting in this freezing cave, is that a so, Canadian joke? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe somewhere up north in Alaska or Canada. <laughs> That's the thing. And if you look at a lot of people who have chronic low body temperature, you know, you look at thyroid issues, you look at people who have things like chronic fatigue syndrome, various elements where there's always a mitochondrial connection. And if there's mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, the gradient doesn't flow efficiently and the uncoupling proteins, which are what detach electrons from that gradient to increase heat production thermogenesis it doesn't work so well and that mm. also means that fat metabolism will be compromised because that's the only way that you can burn fat for energy is via mitochondrial function exactly and there's there's so many ways we can go down so many different rabbit holes but one i did want to explore and you touched on it and which i found fascinating listening to you speak about it was about the defense mechanism and the, the sensing aspect of a mitochondria. So how does that work, Roland? So the, the mitochondria are always speaking back and forth with the nucleus of the cell to basically check in, for lack of better description. And that's how, you know, I, I don't want to use the word a quarterback because I also don't know what Aussie rules football equivalent to a quarterback <laughs> is. But it's something that makes major calls in terms of changing the internal status of the cell. Do they make it more oxidized? Or do they make it more reduced, you know? And reducing agents are attractive to things like viruses, pathogens, whatever, because they want to utilize the resources inside the cell to replicate their own DNA. Like a virus will insert its DNA into the nuclear DNA, and it will use the resources of the cell to feed itself and sustain it itself. And that is not, you know, health-promoting to the host, us, the, the human being. 
So the, the danger response usually initiates from binding mechanisms. There are these things that are called pattern recognition receptors, PRRs, and there's two main ones that get triggered. There's damage-associated molecular patterns, DAMPs, and then there's pattern-associated molecular patterns, which would be PAMPs. That's how I remember the shorthand. Bacterial antigens or various things can bind to these receptors inside the cell, and then the binding of those receptors, it's almost like initiating a program response. Because if the cell is sensing threat, and that threat is gonna have the resources of the cell be consumed, not for the cell's benefit, but for something else's benefit, well then the mitochondria will start spinning out a whole bunch of reactive oxygen species. It will oxidize the cell, which will take energy away from the cell to build compounds that those viral or bacterial factors could then use for their own resources. So it's responding to an external threat. You know, if you look at, a, imagine a movie, right? And then you're inside this camp and then there's, there's uh, um, cameras on the exterior and there's motion detectors. When something trips the motion detector, the alarm beep, beep, starts going off and then all the troops are going to their positions. It's the same kind of fractal pattern that's in, existing inside the cell. So the mitochondria are the thing that change the internal status of the cell because if a cell's more oxidized, it's a more inhospitable environment for anything to live in. So it's either the cell will choke out the virus or the pathogen, or the cell will commit its own suicide via apoptosis in order to prevent the spread of that viral pathogen, whatever it is, into other neighboring cells. And as a result, it will communicate with neighboring cells, so they might initiate the same program. Wow. That is, that right? is just, that, that, that's just, wow. What, what a way to start the podcast with, with that bit of, you know, that truth bomb. And it's, it's incredible. Like, the, the innate intelligence of these these little archaic bacteria and yeah, I've read some, right? these little, they and are a bacteria or like or they originated to be a bacteria totally separate from a eukaryotic cell let's just it, it, when, when you think about the the body it's really a story of microbes isn't it you've got you've got the mitochondria which are a colony of archaic bacteria that, that are living in the cell that now have become organelles within the cell. And then you've got the microbiome, which we will dig very deep into very shortly. But let's, be in some deep shit. <laughs> sorry, say that again. It'll be in some deep shit. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Pardon the pun. <laughs> sorry if I swore. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yep. So you mentioned there's a couple of other, so it's very clear to me that they are, very important in terms of the immune system and the way the immune system functions and correct me if I'm wrong, but they initiate this almost this alert status. If this, if the body becomes invaded with a virus or some form of pathogen. So it's putting all the troops, all the immune cells on high alert. Is that how you would word it? Um, the immune cells? Yes. But also, um, it changes the activities going on inside the cell. You know what I mean? So whereas, you know, the ribosomes are going to be building proteins and stuff of that nature. You know, Navio coins these as polymers. They're structures that are being complexly built. The mitochondria will actually oxidize the cell enough to have those broken down. So the cell goes catabolic. So it nice. basically stops the growth process starts the initiating the breakdown process. And as a result, it will attract immune cells and various other things that can maybe go to the site of that infection mm -hmm. and help gobble up some of the collateral damage for lack of better description. But you know, a lot of the immune cells have their own mitochondria as well. So if they're, if the danger response is being initiated, then it's changing the default state of the immune system to be more reactive. It may be raising TH1 or TH2 or TH17 style responses and it's mm -hmm. going to direct certain immune cells to make higher levels of cytokines, those mm -hmm. inflammatory signal molecules that then direct certain immune cells to activity, be it gobbling, you know, macrophages start building things up, you know, monocytes go to the site of uh, inflammation and they basically start to help break down the inflammatory tissue or the inflammatory byproducts. So yeah, it's right. going to basically make the body on high alert and it's a non, it's a specific, but a non-specific response. What I mean by that is, this likely happens in various scenarios of inflammatory conditions. So it's not necessarily pigeonholed into, oh, this is only with autoimmune. It's with an inflammatory status. So this is what's happening inside the body. So you can imagine if this is localized to an organ, 
then that organ is going to become to a degree dysfunctional because an organ is nothing more than a collection of specialized cells. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in layman's terms, if I get this right, the mitochondria are modifying the environment around the cell. And within, correct. And within the cell. And you mentioned these words, and some people might not be familiar with it, react reactive oxygen species or ROS. ROS. Are you able to, to define what these are and how they are created and how do they signal? Yes. So, I mean, reactive oxygen species, a synonym is called a free radical. So it's a fancy way of saying it's something with an unpaired electron. And unpaired electrons are somewhat renegade. They're unpredictable in their behavior. And because they crave an electron, anything they touch, they oxidize, right? They steal an electron from it and leave that thing with an unpaired electron. That's the textbook way of explaining it. Uh, a layman's terms way of thinking of a free radical or a reactive oxygen species, it's a compound that's a signaling molecule. And the signal or the message it promotes is oxidization. Because one of the main concepts inside the cell is what's called redox, reduction and oxidization balance. In a healthy cell, a cell can reduce and oxidize at will because it's always going to be making reactive oxygen species via mitochondrial existence. The main purpose for reactive oxygen species are signaling molecules. If there's too many of them and the cell has enough antioxidants, you know, superoxide dismutase, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and in some cases compounds that we eat from various foods, then if it goes too oxidized, then something can act as an antioxidant and bring it back into balance. I'm trying to do this little teeter-totter <laughs> thing with my hands. <laughs> However, in some cases, um, as a mitochondria or a series of mitochondria, because there's never just one like a book depicts inside the cell, there's up to a thousand in certain cells or more, um, it will overly oxidize in response to a threat of its internal environment. So the reason you overly oxidize a cell is if something is causing a cell to be unable to function, that cell will then oxidize to either initiate destroying whatever is trying to inhabit it, or it will kill the cell for trying to contain what's in there via apoptosis. Mm -hmm. You know, there's two ways of cell death. Apoptosis is an implosion. So the cell dies. The mitochondria is also the main switch with that, with something called cytochrome C oxidase. Mm -hmm. And the apoptosis will basically say, initiate self-destruct, but don't damage anything peripherally. Wow. Necrosis is the opposite. That's an explosion. And mm -hmm. then all those inflammatory compounds are going to affect peripheral cells and maybe cause them to become overly oxidized. So the free radicals have a double-edged sword. They're great signaling molecules. It's how the mitochondria communicate with the nucleus to correlate energy status inside the cell, or various other things inside the cell to change the genetic transcription of that cell. But in high quantities, it overly oxidizes the cell. So think of it as rusting the cell prematurely. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of rusting from the inside out if there's too much oxidation going on. And then... then think of a car that's overly... I mean, in Australia, I'm sure you guys don't see too much rust. But in Canada, with all the salt and the crap we put on the roads in the winter... If a car starts to rust on the surface, it's just a little bit of surface rust. It's more cosmetic. Mm -hmm. But if the rust enters the chassis systemically, then the chassis rigidity becomes compromised because the rusted metal is weak. So mm -hmm. if you get in an accident, the car is going to fold in half like an accordion. Same kind of concept with the body, right? A little bit of rust here and there. You can buff it out. You sand it. You know, you patch it, paint it. But if it's systemic, then you know that the, the tissue is becoming very damaged because the health span of that tissue is shrinking, it's reducing. And then symptom, disease state, whatever happens. I love the analogies. You've got to keep those analogies going. They're awesome. And analogies even, and metaphors, I was told, are the greatest teaching tools ever. So good. <laughs> you, can't, you kind of look like Jesus a little bit. So it's it's like, a, like the parables of Jesus. Me on this podcast. He's like, my guest today is Jesus Christ. <laughs> It's okay. It's it's a great like I know this guy from somewhere, but I don't know why I like him. That's why. <laughs> and, then, and then he comes up with all these parables, and you think, well, there's a really strong. Jesus was a scientist. Oh, sorry, not a scientist, a clinician. <laughs> <laughs> and what and what I, I kind of I love about that connection. But we're frozen. Did we freeze? Just the video part.
Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Ah, you're back. There we go. Oops. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> slight, slight technical issue, but we're back. We're back online. So what I was maybe saying, maybe Jesus coming. <laughs> may, maybe you got unhappy with us. I don't know. <laughs> I waved my hand too much, and the computer just went. <laughs> <laughs> but what what I was saying about the the engine analogy. And maybe maybe you could elaborate a little bit more about this. But what I've read is that the the mitochondria have this what we call an ATPase that spins literally like an engine. Yes, it's the to, world's smallest rotary motor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, we'll basically go into cellular respiration a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So. The whole goal of the mitochondria's ability to create energy is to survive or to promote cell proliferation, optimization of function. And it does that through a gradient, right? So it's a, a difference between positive and negative charge. And it's the energy potential of that gradient, meaning if the inside of the matrix is negatively charged and just outside is positively charged, it's the protons rushing through that motor that initiate the spin. So something is powering it. And the spin is doing nothing more than combining ADP, which is adenosine, adenosine diphosphate, with, inorganic, with organic phosphate. So it just basically smashes these things together and spits them out. And it basically throws them into the cell, from my understanding, to be utilized by anything that requires energy to do work. So the motor is being turned to generate energy currency for the cell. And that energy currency is being gobbled up by the cell in order to perform work. The process of, of aerobic respiration, which is the one that, that we should focus on based upon that's what mitochondria are meant to do is, you know, you have these cytochrome proteins. You have first cytochrome, you have your complex two, you have your coenzyme Q10, you have your third complex, you have cytochrome C oxidase, and you have your fifth complex ATPase, right? So it's basically that electrons that come in from the Krebs cycle are being passed across these cytochrome proteins. For every electron that comes in, a proton gets pumped out because the body likes balance, positive and negative charge together neutralize each other. So when they're pushed apart, these you know, cytochrome, sorry, rather these electrons are going across as gradient and they're creating this difference in charge for energy potential. And the whole goal is to get that energy potential to spin this little rotary motor to make ATP. And you know, we talk about ATP, everyone knows aerobic respiration via glucose. You know, you make 38 ATP. But if you look at the other side of it, your body can also burn fatty acids and one molecule of palmitic acid yields about 109 ATP. Wow. So it's a lot more energy efficient to be burning more fat for energy predominantly than it is for carbohydrates. It's just, you know, more common to study glucose because it goes from glucose to pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. And what I always say is, to a degree, your body doesn't care what it turns into energy because fats and carbs both get converted into the same molecule that enters the TCA cycle, and that spin of that cycle just spits out electron donors that run the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So the goal is just to keep that process moving very efficiently and to come back to your original question you know, about free radicals or reactive oxygen species. They get formed when electrons don't go down the gradient. They leak out at specific cytochrome sites. The principal know. site of leakage is the first cytochrome, and I believe the most uh, second common site is the third cytochrome, where they leak out. So the problem is, when this electron leaks out and combines with a molecule of oxygen, you get a reactive oxygen species, molecule of oxygen with an extra electron without a pair. 
And then that thing can go around and oxidize whatever it does end up touching. So if someone is experiencing high levels of ROS, it just means that the gradient in their mitochondria isn't very efficient. Maybe there's um, a protein assembly issue. Maybe the membrane itself is too porous. There's too much leakage out of the membrane. Now we can't measure those per se. You can measure certain things on the results of metabolomics testing clinically. But usually when you're looking at anything where there's mitochondrial dysfunction, you know there's a downregulation of gradient potential. There's a, an upregulation of reactive oxygen species production. And that alone will set up a chain of reaction of the events inside the mitochondria, but also inside the cell. Mm, that's a wonderful description. I did want to cover that as well with all the different different sites on the mitochondria. And you've so eloquently described it. And hopefully people can follow along with with how it functions, the electron transport chain. Can I do something really quickly to share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. This might help. Um, see right here on the left-hand side? Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I was basically talking about, right? You know, you have your first complex, you have your complex two, you have your third complex, you have your uh, cytochrome C oxidase, which is a little guy that's in uh, lighter blue here. You have complex four. And this rotary thing, this, this thing that looks like kind of like a weird shape and chest piece upside down, that's the guy you were mentioning in regards to creating ATP. You're taking the sum of ADP, adenosine diphosphate plus one phosphate molecule, mm -hmm. and you are actually creating ATP from it. So, I mean, the process in and of itself is pretty simple. It's getting to the point to say the process is simple that's a little more difficult because it, it requires digging into some textbooks and making sense of systems and processes. And yeah. then you say, well, how do I, how do I apply this? Oh, okay. I get it now. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a hundred percent with you, Roland. And if someone there's listening to this and their head's starting to hurt, the key takeaway is that there's this literally this little spinning motor inside the mitochondria that's producing an energy currency that then the body uses and if you're not if this whole system is not working properly we're going to see dysfunction in mitochondria which correct me if i'm wrong roland are present in all cells aside from red blood cells yes they give off their mitochondria as they're being formed um, to donate the iron because there's a lot of iron sulfur clusters inside but they don't have any mitochondria you're absolutely correct and there's also a gradient of mitochondrial concentration in certain cells. You know, muscle, liver, and brain cells, from my understanding, have the highest concentrations of mitochondria per cell. Because right. they use so much energy. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. And I think that's a great segue now to talk about the gut. Wow, because, yes. Because my understanding is because you mentioned all these major organs in the body, the brain, the heart. Mm -hmm. The gut is also the biggest interface to the outside world. And I think you, you've touched on this as well. It's the gut actually sits outside of the body. It's the last line of outside of the body yeah. as I see it. You know, I've said that in, in, in a podcast before because colonocytes and pterocytes, every cell in, in the gut has a high concentration of mitochondria because those cells are so important for absorption for mucosal production for the creation of immune cells antimicrobial peptides so the mitochondria in the gi system the cells themselves are the direct interface with the rainforest that is our microbiota microbiome interaction so yeah that that's a great segue and those mitochondria have um, the ability to influence the function of the mitochondria systemically through the activation of certain uh, genetic transcription factors, things like PGC1 alpha, AMPK, sirtuin proteins, uh, because what happens locally affects the body systemically. Nothing is truly separate. Mm. Medicine, we segregate cardiology, neurology, nephrology, but what affects one thing affects everything. Question there, just pause you for a sec. Why do we see this is a slightly loaded question, <laughs> pardon oh. the pun, but why? Why do we see typically dis dysfunction showing up in the gut very early? Dysfunction in what context? Like just general dysfunction in relation to other disease states? Yeah, because you know how there's like this, this uh, saying from, who was it? 
one of the philosophers, all disease begins in the gut. Is that Hippocrates? Hippocrates. He, he, he's the one. Exactly. Well, you, you coined it very well. It's the last interface with the outside world. So if something from the outside world is becoming a problem, be it an input signal, or if the, the organ that I call the microbiota has become imbalanced, then that's going to drive an inflammatory response or an imbalance, a disharmony inside the gut that will then ultimately affect everything else in the body. Why? Because there is a, there's a paradoxical thing about the GI system. What I mean by that is if it were meant to be super not permeable, meaning if it were meant to be such a rigid barrier, it wouldn't be constructed as it was. It's actually meant to be an absorptive system first, a barrier second. Because if you look at how the gut's constructed, there's only one layer of cells that is basically between the absorptive surface, the lymphatic system, and the bloodstream, and then the gut itself, which is the lumen, the tube. So the reason that we see things show up early in the gut and then later on downstream is because it's very possible for whatever the result of the inflammatory response being in the gut to then get through that poorly constructed barrier and get into the general circulation. And when something gets into your bloodstream, it goes systemically. That's why leaky gut hyperpermeability of the GI system can be the impetus or the, the, the tipping point, for lack of a better description, to a lot of other diseases because it involves the immune system. Mm. And we have to remember that the purpose of the immune system is either to hurt or heal, right? It's the only system in our body that can do both. So when we piss the gut off, we piss the immune system off because most of the immune cells reside in the GI system because of how big it is. If you were to take the GI system and flatten it out, it would be a couple tennis courts worth of, of uh, air surface area because mm. it's meant to be as absorbative as possible. But it also requires a lot of policing because the immune cells that reside there, they have to cover a lot of ground. And there's, yeah. there's a lot of them that are needed. So that's why we see something show up in the gut before it usually shows up somewhere else. And that can be said for a lot of diseases, a lot of conditions. Absolutely. I love that analogy, Roland, that if I could summarize, the, the gut is like this massive interface to the outside world. It's, it's a barrier that's trying to absorb nutrients in, so letting things in that the body can use, but then trying to keep out things that can potentially harm the body. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. And, and you look how it's constructed. It's cells that are bound together with proteins, tight junction proteins. And these proteins are actually porous, meaning they're meant to let water through. But if these, these tight junction proteins, due to an inflammatory state, start to become compromised, the proteins don't construct themselves properly, they start to misfold, then that really tight space starts to do this. Mm. And then rather than you know paracellular transport through the cell like so, it actually can fall through that small gap directly into the bloodstream, which initiates an immune response because it's likely something that was never meant to get through the tube. It's meant to get taken out when you, you know, have a poop. Mm, exactly. So with this big, big hollow tube running through the body with lots of different winding little curves to expand out the, the surface contact so we can absorb as much material as possible. Exactly. You say winding curves. I got this like this picture of these bacteria riding on top of a turd going, guys, you're trying to laugh. Guys, you're trying to do that, but I would if I were in there. But either way, yeah, we have this like ecosystem that is, you know, a postnatal organ. We are um, we're born and we're inoculated as we go through the birth canal. Ideally, there are other methods of being born that changes how we're inoculated. And that thing develops based upon the exposures to things we put in our mouth, things that get in our, you know, our nasal cavity, things that get into our, our bloodstream, whatever, not our bloodstream, but things that get into orifices, right? Mm -hmm. And then the development of that is constantly dynamic based upon a multitude of factors. And the whole goal with gut health microbiota development is you want to create a microbiota that helps create a symbiotic relationship with not only the host us but the mitochondria that live in the very cells that you mentioned because that that little wheel of us the mitochondria the microbiota and the host ultimately determines if the body is in a healthy state or in an inflamed state i love that that's beautiful and it's that that harmony between these micro biotic cultures that are living 
within our body, the, the mitochondria within the cell, and then the gut microbiome, microbiota, which is huge, diverse range of bacteria, protozoa, fungi, yeasts, everything. viruses, everything. Uh, and it's all, sorry, what was that? Even phages, which is phages, a new area absolutely, yeah. absolutely phages or phages or phages or however you pronounce it in some know, part exactly. of the world. <laughs> But th- I love how you, you put that. It's, it's like this harmony between these two symbionts to create a harmonious relationship between themselves, but then also hopefully protecting the host because that promotes their own survival agenda as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, you want to create as hospitable an, an environment for yourself the patterns exist within the microbes. They maybe not have the same conscious level of thought. I mean, when I'm designing a space, I want to balance the energy in the space and, and decorate it the way I want to see it. But a microbe wants to live in an environment that it can adhere to, that it gets enough food. Um, and then it, it has a, a harmonious environment with the other species of microbes that live in there. So it becomes a dynamic ecosystem. Mm. And, you know, the, the problem that we're running into nowadays, and I say this in my presentations, you know, I call people with healthy guts unicorns because I don't see them very much anymore. You know, mm. we got to capture them. We got to study them, figure out what it is they do, because the vast majority of G- people I see, um, they come to me for GI issues. They come to me for gut related issues. And I use functional lab testing. Uh, usually Genova Diagnostics is my go-to with health optimization so I can at least get some insight into what's going on with their gut, be it, you know, inflammatory protein upregulation, be it digestive insufficiencies, uh, bacterial infections or yeast infestations, as you mentioned, you know, with candida albicans or citromelic acid from, uh, you know, Saccharomyces, for example, or various other things that might say, okay, something in the gut is causing this imbalance to show itself. And we can maybe pick this up years before this becomes an actual symptom. But the vast majority of people, you know, you look at the commercials for, oh, Zantac, this is an antacid. This is something for GI distress. This is Imodium, so you don't have liquid diarrhea. Mm. That's a sign that something's wrong. Mm. Don't, it's like, it's like putting cologne on a piece of shit. It doesn't smell <laughs> better because it's still a piece of shit. We need to figure it. out how to remove that in the first place. Exactly. So that's, that, that's the dance when it comes to being able to maintain that dynamic ecosystem is, if there's something that's going on with it, how do you remedy that? Then how do you push it in the right direction in order to maintain or continuously improve the long-term health consequences? Consequences sounds like a negative turn. Long-term <laughs> health opportunities of what that person can hopefully experience. Love that, Roland. And I, I think at this point, people are starting to understand how important the gut microbiome is, the interaction with mitochondria now let's talk. Now, how do these two colonies communicate with each other? Yeah, so they basically can communicate. It's bidirectional, right? So <clears throat> the gut microbiota create these metabolites that can affect the health of the cells. For example, they can create lactate, lactic acid, that can then be converted into something that the cells, the mitochondria can use for fuel. They can create short-chain fatty acids that directly actually enter the colonocytes or the enterocytes, butyrate, uh, propionate, and acetate are the three major ones, butyrate being the most well-researched. They can create things called urolithins, which are improving the the ability for the mitochondria to stimulate the biogenesis process, which is increasing the concentrations of mitochondria or the health and well-being of them. Mm-hmm. And as a result of the microbiota producing these compounds, they can actually influence the health and well-being of the gut barrier. They can influence the health and well-being of how robustly the mitochondria take the food inside your cells and turn it into energy, which then can have a systemic effect by upreg- upregulating uh, total body genetic transcription factors that I mentioned before. Things that influence the body being better at turning food into energy and less adept at storing energy in the form of body fat because you improve fat metabolism. <clears throat> Conversely, mitochondria can affect the gut barrier function and ultimately the health and well-being of the microbiota by spitting out things like reactive oxygen species, uh, changing gut barrier function, and resulting in creating a scenario where an inflammatory response or a dysbiosis can develop because of dysfunctional enterocytes and gut barrier itself. 
So they have this back and forth crosstalk. I think, I think, I think, I think. Oh, I don't have it on this one. I had a graphic, but I don't know where it is. That's okay. It's a back and forth thing. So the redox status of the cell will affect the gut barrier and ultimately influence the microbiota and the dynamics between them. And the compounds that the microbiota create will directly affect the mitochondria because they'll crosstalk back and forth. Like hydrogen sulfide, nitric oxide can inhibit energy production inside the colonocytes. So it really depends what's going on within the isolated microbiota and what's going on within the mitochondria themselves and how the two interface with each other. Mm. And if we could just get get a massive microscope and zoom in right into the the lining of the gut and talk about those gut cells, I think you call it enterocytes. Yes. So what's the scenario of, you know, the little zoo of animals running around that is the microbiota and the, the actual enterocyte being the cell, the little organelles inside the mitochondria. Now, how does that dynamic work? If you could give an example, sure, a specific yeah, so example. It can be directly through love. So let's look at some of the positive elements. Mm-hmm. If those microbiota, are breaking down adequate amounts of soluble fibers that come in through diet. They're creating these short chain fatty acid compounds that can diffuse through the mucosal layer and they can directly enter into those enterocytes and they can feed them. So we talked about a symbiotic relationship. The bacteria living in our gut, providing that we create an optimal environment, will then produce food for the colon themselves, Mm -hmm. itself rather. So Mm -hmm. the, the bacteria will break down these fibers And it will use the the creation of those fibers to improve the environment for the proliferation of a healthy gut bacteria. For example, uh, an acidic environment is one that yeast doesn't grow in very well. Mm -hmm. So the colon should be a very acidic, oxygen-free environment. So we have a lot of diverse populated anaerobic bacteria. That is also dependent on the gut cells being able to make a nice physical barrier. So you know, in the colon, for example, we have something called a bilipid or a bimucosal layer. So you have a thick layer of mucus, the cells are here, you have a watery layer of mucus, the bacteria live up here. Mm-hmm. So the goblet cells are secreting mucus constantly, and they require strong mitochondrial function in order for that mucus to be constantly synthesized. On top of that, you know, there are certain specialized cells like enteroendocrine cells and various other things that influence the turnover of those enterocytes. Your digestive cells uh, turn over every three to five days. So it's like um, the the dance is you have this innate stem cell, which needs to be powered up in order to be able to differentiate and become an enterocyte or a goblet cell or a panath cell or whatever. And it requires the, the mitochondria to be fed a direct stream of those short chain fatty acids or certain elements of glucose coming in from diet. So they create this dance back and forth, but they can't do this without each other. The bacteria have to be there to power up the the colonocytes Mm. to maintain that gut barrier function of the mucosal layer. And the enterocytes need to be there so they can actually create an environment for the microbiota to live in. And that's how it goes back and forth, yeah. That's incredible. Isn't it, Roland, beautiful how Mother Nature's designed this, this system it's just phenomenal like we're only just starting to scratch the surface in terms of how these things work but wow it's true i mean i I, you know we are i I call myself a glutton for punishment on ari's podcast because i've chosen to specialize in a field that moves faster than any other field in science seemingly seemingly but that's what I, I get so excited about because it's that that constantly elucidates new things new targets You know, like new drug targets are going to be based upon your microbiota profile because certain microbiota make drugs ineffective and certain Mm -hmm. actually make drugs more effective. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There are certain elements that that we're now figuring out, you know, with um, certain elements of autoimmunity being something that causes the immune system to become confused, the molecular mimicry thing that can maybe be connected to certain elements of autoimmune disease manifestations. So these things are all becoming very interesting. I was just reading um, an article today that outlined the role of the microbiota mitochondria interaction in colorectal cancers, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. Wow. So these things are all starting to become a lot more 
connected because to understand them would mean that we figured them out. But you said that it's, we're just learning the innate wisdom of mother nature and all she's done to create us and how <laughs> complex yet patternistic simplicity we, we have, right? There's this patternistic simplicity and, and that symbiosis, symbiosis and balance is really what we're trying to strive for. Absolutely. And um, the conversation's just been flowing so well that we've pretty we're pretty much at time. But we've blown I, I, over time. We, we've, well, blown, we've gone. We've gone. We've smashed the time element. But I think there's a, there's a few more rabbit holes to explore if if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. Yeah, we can do that. I'm, I'm all yours, my man. So let's do it. Awesome. So I think we we covered we covered a lot of ground in terms of how these why what they are how they interact and why they're so important. But I think what we can explore is perhaps how do we improve communication? Like we could explore both systems individually and then come back with improving the whole thing. Or we could just say like, how, how do we, if we, we start with mitochondria, how do we improve the function of the mitochondria? That's a, Good question. I thought about this a lot because there is this saying that I like, and it's, if you're a clinician, so someone's sitting in front of you, so what do you do? I can't measure AMPK. I can't measure a lot of these cool pathways that we've spoken about, but I can assume that there are things based upon how the pathway is activated. For example, if someone is looking at how to optimize mitochondrial function through diet, well, you know that metabolic flexibility is a big thing. The ability to burn carbohydrates or fats. Someone who has some degree of metabolic dysregulation, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, even hypoglycemia, you know that there's something that's not functioning or flowing smoothly, as you just put it with our conversation, from the food choice process to the digestive process, to the absorption and utilization process. Something simple as restricting the uh, time feeding window that you give yourself, mm. because when you restrict food, you force your body to turn over to stored energy, and that's in the form of fat cells, right? Stored fat and fat cells can then shift the body back into a state where it's more able to actually burn fat as a predominant source of fuel. So not only do we regulate that hunger signal by tapping into that, uh, there are some elements of that that become very anti-inflammatory to the body because constantly feeding the body is like constantly shoving food into a kitchen. There's only so much food that can be cooked before the stove is either full or you run out of power and electricity. So that's one of the first things I would say. Um, something else that you can also do too is looking at what cofactors are needed to create energy via the mitochondrial oxidation process. You know, to turn carbs into energy, vitamin B1, magnesium, um, vitamin B2, to turn fats into energy, you know, vitamin B5 is one of the most important things. And then when it comes to that, that cycle that we spoke about, you know, you need vitamin B1, B2, B3, iron, sulfur, manganese, all these cofactors are needed. So if you're not getting them from your diet, you might have a scenario where you have all this energy coming in the form of carbohydrates, macronutrients, fats, but your micronutrients are deficient. So eating a, a more micronutrient energy dense, I'm sorry, micronutrient dense energy sparse diet is going to make sure that you have the requisite balance of, you know, both nutrients in order for that process to be taken care of seamlessly. Uh, and then you look at disposal on the other side, certain elements of activity push the mitochondria to actually have to upregulate their process. It could be something simple as walking, you know, outside on a nice day because mm -hmm. you're using fat as an energy source, providing that your blood sugar is balanced. And then when you want to really push the mitochondria, doing resistance training, uh, interval training, short duration sprints activates your anaerobic system, which powers up your aerobic system to regenerate those energy stores so you can do it again and again. So you're basically looking at the input and the output variables for mitochondria and looking at how do I optimize those through my diet, my lifestyle, my sleep, my activity factor. And then because I know we're a little bit short on time, uh, maybe I'll come back to do, you know, a part two of this if, if mm -hmm. you want to dig deeper. When it comes to the GI system, it all starts with the digestive process. Because if the digestive process is compromised, you don't chew your food enough, you're not relaxed enough to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, you're not making enough stomach acid, you're not making enough enzymes, 
enough bile, then that food is not going to get properly digested, segmented and broken down to something that can be properly absorbed. And then you dig a layer deeper is looking at the food choices themselves, you know, high starch, low fiber, high sugar foods are great at supporting the overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria and yeasts, especially if someone's had a history of antibiotics, making sure we get adequate amino acids because the mucosal layer is very amino acid, re amino acid rich rather. And the glycocalyx where the bacteria live in is uh, carbohydrate and amino acid rich. So making sure those substrates are there. And then finally choosing different kinds of plant foods that vary the kinds of fibers, the kinds of phytonutrients, the kinds of resistant starches that actually feed the bacteria. You know, when I go uh, to a restaurant and I'm looking at a menu, in my head I have this little like instant analysis of, okay, what micronutrients are in this? What kind of fibers? What phytonutrients? What is it going to do to my blood sugar? And I make my food suggestions based upon that. And a simple challenge is see how many different foods you can eat in the day. So this way, we don't know what food necessarily feeds what bacteria, other than there are some companies that are targeting fiber. Mm -hmm. But if you vary what you bought, your body experiences from a food perspective, you vary your micronutrients, you vary your fibers. And if you combine those foods well, so you digest them optimally and you're going to the bathroom on a regular basis, you're likely going to do much better than the vast majority of people out there who eat for convenience or don't prioritize food quality or quantity or selection whatsoever. Mm. Those are all wonderful suggestions. And one area that I'd like to cover off is how about hormesis? What is hormesis? Hormesis, ah, hormetic stresses. Um, mm -hmm. Hormesis, you know, why don't we look at a, a, a very specific example of hormesis? Intermittent mm -hmm. fasting is hormesis. Why? Because you're subjecting your body to a, a stressful condition in which the response to that stress will yield a positive net solution. What I mean by that is fasting is basically cutting off the energy input assembly, right? So no energy is coming in, but the body still needs the same amount of energy to, kick, to sustain itself. So it changes the influence of how your cells have to perform and have to react to that situation. If we're not ingesting food, then we know that via body fat, we have stored energy that's sitting on our tissues. So the hormetic stress of fasting is actually going to upregulate the enzymes and the endocrine system to be better at breaking fat down from storage, delivering that fat to the cells, and metabolizing that fat for energy. So you restore metabolic flexibility from fasting via hormesis of fasting itself. Mm -hmm. and one other way, like cold exposure or heat shock proteins via a sauna, exercise is hormesis. The only thing I will say with hormesis in regards to being an option for someone is make sure it's an appropriate stress for you. For example, someone who's hypoglycemic who wants to do a 24 hour fast, yeah, that might not be a good idea. You might want to start with like eight or 12 hours mm. or someone who has chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, doing cold exposure or going for an ultra intense sauna session that might push you over the edge and you might be laid up for a little bit. Mm. So hormesis is what, what stimulates the body to be more dynamic and its ability to thrive under certain conditions and scenarios. It's whatever that hormesis is for you. That might be the appropriate choice, or it might be a little, you know, consider the, the stresses of the environment mm -hmm. and the stresses of the activity before you go for it. So it's choosing a sensible stressor to challenge the body and elicit metabolic flexibility for, for one of yeah. a better word. I mean, antioxidants are hormetic stress to the cell because they cause a reduction stress that forces the cell to be able to balance out the reduction oxidization thing that I spoke about. So mm -hmm. an antioxidant is actually a very, very mild stress that improves the antioxidant defenses of the cell. So mm -hmm. by eating colored vegetables, you're doing hormesis technically. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a lot of those polyphenols, in, in the coloring compounds of the fruit end up in the, the colon, isn't it? Yeah. And they influence the change in microbial diversity. Yeah. Cause the body can't digest it. The, the, the microbiota actually digest it. It's true. The, there was one thing I wanted to ask you. What was that? Ah, a, a couple of things that you just, just a few definitions just to round off the conversation. Now you mentioned something called mitophagy, mitophagy. And, then, and then you mentioned something called mitochondrial biogenesis. 
Now, what do these terms actually mean? So mitophagy is mitochondrial specific autophagy, which is a process of the, the way I look at it is the recycling of old worn out material to repurpose for building new material. So it's a way for the cell to utilize resources that may be old and worn out and underperforming, break them down and incorporate them into new resources. So for mitochondria, they can go through mitophagy. In some cases that involves clearing out old dysfunctional mitochondria that will create too many reactive oxygen species and incorporating those components into the birth of new mitochondria because they divide and they, they fuse together and they, call, they do something called fission where they birth new mitochondria. Mm. So autophagy and mitophagy can donate materials to what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the creation of new mitochondria, usually to suit the increased energy requirements of the cell. An example of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis that someone can engage in is through intensive exercise. Mm. You know, that's why endurance athletes are so good at, at aerobic exercise is because they have a lot of mitochondria density in their muscle cells because the constant, you know, biking, running, swimming, if they're triathletes, is the stress that the body becomes more adaptive to. So they will increase the amount of mitochondria in the muscle cell via mitochondrial biogenesis and the body will break down old worn out mitochondria via mitophagy so you don't have dysfunctional energy production organelles in the cell. Mm, so the, the homesis lends itself to creating more mitochondrial density. It can, absolutely, in yes. In certain exactly. exercise. Because if you keep telling your body via, through exercise that I need to be able to produce a lot of energy, then the body is going to respond by making you better at producing a lot of energy. It's just more like the adaptive mechanisms that, that exist within us to better suit our environment. Right. Wonderful. I think we're going to start to wrap now. We've covered an immense amount of ground and hopefully people have been following along the journey. And, you know, certainly if there's any questions, do drop us a note and chat to chat further about some of these concepts. But what I'd like to just cover, cover off now, if, if you could dig into your memory banks and think of some, someone that stands out in your mind, perhaps a, a patient or a client you're working with a particular challenging situation and you know, what was the issue and how you went about dealing and helping this person address that particular issue, pre preferably related to something digestive if possible. Yeah. You know, there, there's one that was actually really cool. Um, I was actually working with, uh, I have a colleague in, in Canada here, her name's Ayla Reed and we do health optimization together. Mm -hmm. And um, one of her clients we were working together on, they were experiencing something that was a combination of GI distress, but also something related to um, the inability to metabolize energy properly from a body composition and an energy metabolism perspective. So I ran some functional lab testing, and then we looked and dig, we dug into the actual information that resulted in elucidating that there was an overgrowth of some yeast and fungus, there was some dysbiotic bacteria, uh, there was some compromised abilities to run the Krebs cycle, but also the inability to burn fat effectively for energy. And via the combination of supporting energy metabolism, um, supporting GI health, so managing the dysbiosis, improving the digestive process, and then helping to build a more proliferative microbiome through supplementation, but also removing specific foods. Uh, I think within a matter of like 11 or 12 days, they dropped the equivalent amount of pounds, like 11 or 12 pounds, totally changed how they looked, how they felt, wow. energy levels. This person was very young. Wow. So you know, that, that was a really cool thing in the sense of um, young people heal really quickly, really, really quickly. If I think of another case where it was actually quite profound, um, I have a client here who had a combination of chronic anxiety, uh, couldn't leave the house without knowing where every bathroom was within a square kilometer radius of where they were going for fear of what would happen. And I think she's now at the point where she goes to the gym and she's showing her husband up in terms of her performance levels, totally changed her mindset, changed her career. She says she got her life back because everything inside of her was very imbalanced. It was a combination of mitochondrial dysfunction, um, the inability to regulate energy metabolism, of course, 
and there was some overgrowth of yeast and dysbiosis based upon the results of our testing. Mm. So I find, you know, you balance out these things in the system, you move a couple nodes in the network, and then you restore the body's ability to just do what it's meant to do. And that's optimize its function and maintain health. Yeah. And the body doesn't know how to disease itself. It's what we do to it that does it. Absolutely. And I'm a firm believer of the principle that it all comes back to nature. I mean, we're all, we're trying to understand the mechanisms of how these things work and then trying to adjust it. But it seems to always go back to the body's innate intelligence and going back to how we naturally evolved for want of a better word. And that's, that's, you know, what Dr. Ted's principles with health optimization are, you know, you have these pillars that support what the body's trying to do. And one of the long views is evolutionary biology and evolutionary medicine. You know, well, how did humans get to this point? And a lot of the things that, that we implement to get someone better are mimicries of, you know, what the body's optimized to be yoked to, you know, environmental factors, the sun, circadian rhythm, food choices, stress management, all of that stuff play a massive role in maintaining our health long-term. Massive. Absolutely. Roland, we've pretty much come up to time, but if there was, I always ask this question at the end, if there was one thing you could do for your gut health, because it is the Gut Health Gurus podcast after all, what would it be? One thing, oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot. (laughs) (sighs) You know, it's not going to be super sexy. It's not going to be revolutionary, but eating in a relaxed environment, focusing on being mindful in the process of eating and chewing thoroughly is the easiest thing that someone can do to optimize not only that experience because it's for you, but tasting the food, getting involved in the experience, not watching like intense videos on YouTube (laughs) while you're eating something or shoveling something in your face as you're driving somewhere, you know, make your meal times a sacred time, make it your version of meditation where you're just actually in the experience because your body will be primed to do what it is meant to do with that food. And the downstream effects of everything will yield a better outcome. Wow. Wonderful, simple, actionable advice to, to take on today. So I highly the highest form of sophistication sometimes. Right? <laughs> so simple. And Roland, now if people are fully engaged in what you're saying today, they want to work with you, they want to reach out with you now. How can they find you and connect with you? And, and if, if they need help, how can they get it? Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say is I'm actually looking to find a way to bring health optimization to Australia via, via telemedicine. Mm-hmm. So I know that there is a place in Australia that does the testing that I need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I have to figure out where they're located. So what, what I could do is if there are people that are interested, um, they can reach me in two different ways. Uh, the company, Ted, Dr. Ted and I actually have a company in Canada called RTTR Corp. So if you go to rttrcorp.com, mm-hmm. uh, there is a contact field there and it does have some explanation about health optimization and some of the other services we offer. Uh, and then I'll give you the same um, option as I gave to Ari, where if people want to contact me, they can use my business email, which is my full name, Roland, R O L A N D. Pankowich, P-A-N-K-E-W-I-C-H at Mm -hmm. gmail.com. And there, if people are interested in figuring out what it is I do, what the process is, and if we can move forwards, they can shoot me off an email and uh, I will get back to them as soon as possible. I'm about to take off to Zurich for a conference soon. So if those do email and there is a little bit of a lag time, I will get to you when the jet lag has adjusted. (laughs) Um, but yeah, that, that's a great way to get a hold of me and, and inquire about what it is that I do. And if they are interested in optimizing their health, you know, health optimization focuses on measuring wellness. Uh, it's not the best thing to treat disease directly because that's not the focus, but, uh, those who want to perform at a better level and maintain their health as long as possible, that's what we do. Wonderful, man. Huge amount of gratitude, Roland, fountain of knowledge. You broke it down for us so eloquently and succinctly, and I hope people find value in this podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you for having me. We'll have to do this again one day. It was fun. Round two for sure, man. All right, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.